Well, greetings and salutations, everyone. I hope everyone is still doing well, and welcome to this night-ending bonus upload. Before we jump into it, a couple links. As many of you know, I rely on Patreon, PayPal, channel membership, and the merch to help the channel to continue to grow and go. Links to Patreon, PayPal, and channel membership is in the description below. Merch displayed directly under the video. Also, Dogman Frightening Encounters, Volume 1 through 3, the audiobook versions. They were written and researched by Tom Lyons, narrated and produced by me, Jeff Nadolny. Those audiobooks are available on Audible, Amazon, and iTunes, links to which are also in the description as well. And finally, last but definitely not least, if you'd really like to help support the channel to continue to grow and go, simply subscribe. It doesn't cost a cent. Click the like button, takes half a second. If you don't want to miss out on any of the informative uploads I put out daily, click that bell icon and folks, please leave a comment. Why? Well, because all these things really do help the channel to continue to grow and go. And yes, folks, they definitely do matter. Now, everyone, I have taken far too much of your time. Let's jump in to this night ending bonus upload, shall we? This is a very, very strange experience. I was out hiking today because it was fairly warm and sunny. I was hiking along a Corps of Engineer trail along the edge of a river valley below a hydroelectric dam. The weather was still cool enough that in the shade of the trees and cliffs there was ice. I was the only person on the trail proper, but there were people at the overlook at the far end of the trail. I had already been down there to the overlook and was on my way back to the trailhead. It's 3 p.m. and the sun is starting to set because it's setting at around 5 p.m. this time of year. Adding in the fact that the ridge is to the west, the sun would effectively set on that trail at 4.30, at the latest. It was getting colder. I was really happy to be leaving the trail at this point because my double layers were not quite enough. I rounded the corner and I saw this old guy with a twirly handlebar mustache. He was buttoning up a red plaid flannel jacket as he walked down the trail toward me. I was surprised to see him because one, it was way too late for someone to be starting the hike and two, I had not heard him approaching. When I got closer he said something to me but I was walking and couldn't hear him over the crunching of the leaves. This is an oak forest, so there was a good four inches of big crunchy leaves on the ground. I stop and he repeats himself. Can't afford to waste a day like this, can we? I reply, no. Not after how cold it's been. He gave me this weird look as though he didn't know what I was talking about. And then he said, well, good night, and turned and walked away. I went a few feet up the trail, but then I got paranoid. You know, the way you get when you're all alone and suddenly see someone unfamiliar. Like I'm just going to make sure he isn't sneaking up on me with a machete or something. So I turned around and he was gone. I could see a good 50 feet down the trail and into the forest, and he was nowhere. He was in a red flannel coat, old blue jeans, and a gray stocking cap. He was holding a pair of gray knit work gloves, just dressed like a typical old guy in the winter. So he really wasn't camouflaged. He was just gone. I didn't even hear footsteps. To me, that's the weirdest part. Now, I've been listening all day to sounds of things walking because I was looking for deer and bear. So my ears were tuned for that, but I never heard it. It was quiet enough to hear people talking at the campground a quarter of a mile away. I could hear traffic on the dam. I heard the people at the overlook a long time before reaching them. And, like I said, the leaves were so crunchy and loud that I couldn't hear him speak over them. Even the little finches and wrens were making loud noises when they would land or hop in the leaves. It just doesn't seem possible that an old man with a shuffling gait wouldn't make a noise. Further. 
up, I was checking for footprints in the mud because I had noticed big dog paw prints the way down. Other than my own, there were no new prints in the mud, no prints that looked like they had belonged to that guy. When I got to the parking lot, the only vehicles there were my own and a park ranger's. Kind of weirds me out. I mean, it's normal, but it wasn't. Like, if I had thought anything was hinky, I had plenty of time to take a picture of him, but he just looked like an ordinary guy. But when I spoke to him, he just seemed off. Enough that I thought something was up. Today's second experience. I'm a 31-year-old female, but at the time of this, I was 24, and I'm changing names and location of this to protect the people and homeowners' privacy. I have a friend, I'll call her Teresa, who owns a house in Texas that's surrounded by woods. There are houses on the outside of those woods, but they aren't very close to this house. She's lived there with her husband and three children for about five years and never once had any issues. Her husband worked out of town a lot, and when the kids were at school, she'd be alone most of the day since she was a stay-home mom. The house sat on ten acres or so. It had a small pond and a creek that ran all the way through to the center of the woods. When they first moved in, her and I used to walk around through the woods and around the creek, talking and enjoying nature. It was always beautiful and relaxing, so we actually did it a lot, until there really wasn't much more to explore. After a while, she rescued a dog, a beautiful one-year-old boxer named Allie. Allie was shy at first, but she warmed up to Teresa and the kids, who were 9, 10, and 18. Allie became protective of her family. She knew who was friendly and who was a stranger. She didn't really bark at animals, but there were times other random dogs would show up and she asserted her dominance, letting them know that this was her territory. She never attacked or seemed aggressive toward me or anyone, really. You could usually find her in the garage on her bed. She didn't like going inside much and enjoyed rolling around in the grass when the sun was out. They had asked me to the house to sit for them for a few days since... They had wanted to take the kids on vacation for the summer to a water park about six hours away. Of course, I said, yeah, I love their house. It was very beautiful and has a big eight-foot-tall window all around it. I asked if I could have someone stay with me. I hate being alone anywhere. They didn't mind. I asked my boyfriend and sister if they agreed. The day came, a Saturday. My boyfriend and I loaded our bags and headed to Teresa's house. We had made plans to hang out and fish by the pond. We would take advantage and use their four-wheelers and ride around the woods. Teresa's husband and a few of his friends made mud holes and hills in the small area, so we definitely would be getting dirty. I'm a country girl, so fishing and riding through mud is my kind of fun. We arrived as they were loading up their truck, kids running around getting excited and ready to go. I saw Allie sitting in the garage and asked if she would be staying. Teresa said, yeah, that Allie tends to get car sick, so taking her would not be a good idea. I don't mind and go over and pet Allie and play with her. My boyfriend talks with the husband for a bit about using the four-wheeler, do's and don'ts, instructions for feeding Allie, etc., then we say our goodbyes, and they head off down the road. My sister would show up the next day since she had to work that night and couldn't make it. The rest of the day went by smoothly. We enjoyed fishing for a while, drinking a few beers and chatting. Allie joined us and would jump after the lure when we would cast it out and eventually just laid on the ground next to me and fell asleep. At one point, I noticed her poke her head up, staring off in the distance. She didn't make a sound. The pond is to the left of the house, but somewhat in front, while the opening of the creek is even further left. Leading into the woods, this is where she lo was looking. At this point, it's starting to get dark outside, and I couldn't really see what she was looking at. 
About a half an hour later, we decide it's time to go inside, so we cleaned up the fishing poles and picked up our tackle boxes, loading them into the truck. I heard a rustling in the woods next to us, and I jumped. There are lots of deer out here, so I figured it was one that was near, and we startled it when we were moving around. We head back to the house with our gear. Allie had already run back on her own. The room we stayed in had its own bathroom. It was huge. Windows all the way around. The shower was amazing. Had a jacuzzi tub and two walk-in closets. Since there were no other houses around, I immediately undressed without worrying and climbed into the shower. My boyfriend was cooking in the kitchen and I could smell it all the way to the bathroom. It smelled amazing. I didn't realize how hungry I was. I hurried and finished up climbing out and grabbing a towel to dry off. As I dried off, I thought I heard a growl near one of the windows. I looked up in each window, but I couldn't see anything, so I walked a little closer. But all I could see was my reflection. I heard it again. It kind of freaked me out, but then I remembered Allie. Thinking it was her, I rushed and finished got dressed and ran to the kitchen. I told my boyfriend about it, but he brushed it off as Allie being the one that was growling at a rodent or something. We ate, watched a movie, and decided to head to bed, as it was already midnight and we wanted an early start the next day. I fell asleep rather quickly, which isn't the norm for me at all, but was awoken by the sound that scared the hell out of me. It was around 2 in the morning at this point. I heard the growling again, but this time it was deeper, more menacing than before. I slowly reached over to try and wake my boyfriend, but he would not wake up. I lied there listening, and I could hear something walking outside of this room. I had the blinds so I couldn't see anything. I got up and walked over to the window, still hearing the footsteps, but it didn't sound like Allie. It was far bigger. I peeked out of the blind, and I could faintly make out a figure in the shape of a dog or something similar. This was not Allie. Allie is white and tan, so I would have been able to see at least the white part of her. This was dark. Scared, I ran back to the bed and laid there until I fell back to sleep. The next day, I told my boyfriend about what had happened, and he laughed it off, saying it must have been dreaming. I couldn't help it and argued back and he needed to take me serious stop making fun of me for being scared he ended up getting pissed at me for arguing with him about to go on a ride on the four-wheeler even though i begged him not to because there was something in there a few hours later he returns and we have lunch and then we go to the game room and play a game of pool I told him I wanted to go for a ride, but he insisted that I stay inside annoyed. I told him I was going to go play with Allie. I go out and feed her, waiting patiently for her to finish eating. Sitting there, having a smoke, looking out at the land, and seeing something moving in the trees. I'm staring intently, trying my hardest to make out the shape, but it's too far away. Just then Allie perks up and looks in the direction staring and begins growling knowing how she is and seeing her hair stand up i slowly stand watching her and start walking toward the door she growled louder as i ran inside calling for my boyfriend telling him to come outside quick when we get outside Allie has run toward the creature at this point and i start yelling for her to come back once we get to the end of the driveway we can hear Allie barking like crazy Looking in the direction the barking is coming, we can see this creepy-looking thing stand a few feet away from Allie. It's too far away to make out any details, but we can tell it's hairless. And a dark gray, almost black skin tone, I jump in the truck as my boyfriend floors it toward Allie and this creature. By the time we get there, Allie has this thing in the creek, so we run over to see what it, what it is. My boyfriend keeps a gun in the truck at all times and has it loaded and ready. This thing looked like a dog, but it was much bigger. It had fangs two to three inches long that stuck outside of its mouth, even when it was closed. Dark gray, leathery skin with a few patches of thin hair on its body. 
It was pressed up against the wall of the creek, growling, its teeth bared, its eyes were black as night. It had blood on its leg, I'm thinking that Allie tried attacking it. The whole time we stared, stand there in shock at what we are seeing, not moving or making a sound, just watching it. When it moved toward Allie, my boyfriend shot it twice and yelled out. It yelled out a strange, creepy yelp and fell in the water. Allie backed up and let him get closer to the thing. I screamed and said not to get too close. I called animal control and the police to come and get this thing. An hour or so later, after the police and animal control came and took the creature, we had calmed down a bit. I went to go check on Allie and realized she had blood on her neck. I put on some gloves and checked her out, noticing two puncture wounds on her neck. I called the emergency vet and explained the situation. He said I needed to contact animal control first. I called Teresa earlier and filled her in on the situation. She said they would be back in the next day and that I could leave the house, but I needed to take Allie with me. Once I contacted animal control again and told them of Allie, they came back and picked her up, stating that if the creature was diseased, she would need treatment. We promptly left after Allie was picked up. We were not staying there alone again. About two weeks passed before I heard from Teresa again. I called her several times, wanting an update, but they never gave her one. So I decided to call them myself. They told me that it was just a dog with rabies and that Allie was being treated for it. There was no way whatsoever that is true. There are not dogs with three-inch fangs. No way. When I began asking questions, they told me to contact the police if I wanted the answer. The police acted as if they didn't know what I was talking about, saying the case number I gave them didn't exist. The officers that had come out there supposedly did not work there and never had. Are you kidding me? They're hiding something. They don't want us to know what's going on. There is something in the woods here in Texas, and we are not supposed to know about it. Allie came home a couple days later, but she was different. She was more aggressive, growling at Teresa and the kids. They all became afraid of her until one day they, too, had to call animal control. Allie had to be put down that night. She had bitten the animal control officer when he stepped out of his truck. Something happened to her and no one will tell us what actually is going on here. I had taken a picture of it, but it's been so long that I no longer have it. Be careful in the woods. You never know what you'll find or what will find you. All right, so after I finished reading that, I had chills which is kind of hard when you have a fever and your studio is 85 degrees. Um, but where this encounter took place or experience took place was in Texas. I don't know where in Texas, but thinking back, the attack or the bite marks, uh, that were talked about that this strange creature, canine-like creature had, uh, reminded me of Christopher Whiteley uh, from Lipen, Texas. Uh, he was found dead and pretty torn up, pretty bad. The sheriff's department said, mountain lion attack, DNR came out, said this wasn't a mountain lion, and uh, when I contacted Lipen County Sheriff's Department, uh, the deputy that I spoke to said that, I said, well, if this wasn't a wild animal attack, then, then what was it? And he said, you're going to have to talk to uh, the investigator on this case. And I left a message and I never got a call back. So, just kind of more proof that they know what's going on and they want to keep it secret from us. 
today's third experience. I've always had a weird sleep schedule. And when I was 15 and 16, it was very common for me to be up at 2 in the morning and later in the summer. One night at around 3 in the morning, I decided to go outside into the backyard to get some fresh air, since it was a pretty warm night. At the time, I lived in the suburbs of southern Tennessee, in a pretty run-down neighborhood. The house next to ours had been abandoned for a couple years, and I always joked that it was cursed because three separate people had bought it, moved in, and then sold it and moved away again, all within a span of maybe five years before this. At this time, the house was unoccupied and had been for some time. While I was outside, I started to listen to some music on my MP3 player with my headphones on. After a while, I started to hear this growling slash snorting sound that wasn't super loud, but still managed to get past my headphones and music. After pausing the music and listening for a moment, I realized it was coming from behind me where the abandoned house was. It sounded like something pretty big was making the noise. And I figured maybe a large stray dog had gotten into the neighbor's yard, somehow. Since the yard and mine were separated by a tall, sturdy fence, I just ignored it and went back to my music. The noises continued periodically, and finally, after a while, I decided to just go over to the fence and find out what was making the noise. As I approached the fence, I heard this rustling sound on the other side, like something was moving in the tall grass. Figuring now that it was most definitely a stray dog, I leaned in close to the fence and looked through one of the cracks in the boards. A pair of huge yellow eyes were staring directly back at me, at eye level with me. I kind of stood there frozen like an idiot for a few seconds, and then I heard a growling noise again. And this time... It was inches from my face... And that snapped me out of it. I turned and ran back to my house, locked the doors, and failed to sleep that night. The next day, I looked through the fence again to see if there was any logical explanation. Maybe it had been a dog standing on a table or a stack of boxes for some reason. But the yard is totally bare. No boxes, no patio furniture, nothing. Whatever had looked at me was actually as tall as I was. I moved away years ago and have never been back. So I have no idea if that house is empty or not, or how the neighborhood is doing now. But for the rest of the time that I lived there, I deliberately ignored any of the weirdness from the other side of that fence. Today's fourth experience. So my experience is probably a bit different because we were on a boat driving up the coast. Basically, I had decided to go on a trip with a few of my friends to explore and fish, etc. We have a little inflatable dinghy and the camping gear with us to camp on the shore at night as well. There's endless inlets and channels you can go into, and it's just generally an endless amount of nature. We're on our second day of the trip, cruising along. The sun was reflecting in my eyes off of the water, so I couldn't really see well. Suddenly, I see a big log in front of us. I probably overreacted and pulled the throttle back real hard and accidentally put it in reverse. We're going at a decent speed, so definitely not great for the boat. Boat stops before the log, everyone falls, the whole deal. So I avoid hitting the log, but there's this huge slam from the inboard, and the engine goes dead. We're dead in the water, floating, maybe a hundred feet off the shore. I'm trying to figure out what's just happened to the engine while my two buddies are using wooden paddles to keep us from floating too far from land. We had a radio and everything, but obviously the last thing we wanted was to send a call for help before we tried our other options first. There we are, floating along, for trying to figure out what's going to happen, what's wrong with the engine. Gas line had fallen off, possibly. This is where things start to get weird. I'm trying to reattach the gas line, and one of my buddies is like, Hey, there's someone on the shore. This is immediately weird, because we are very far from any land access or roads or anything like that. I look up, and there's a person standing on some rocks watching us. 
They're about ankle deep in the water, just staring at us. Nobody says anything, and we all just stare back. I'd say we're about 75 feet away, but at an angle. The current is bringing us parallel to them. As I'm looking at this person, I start to realize that it's a kid, like maybe seven to eight years old, maybe ten if that. Blonde hair, real dirty looking. Then I see it, like this weird little trailer in the tree line, like an old tent trailer or something that you would tow behind a car, but it's up in the trees, kind of tipped on an angle and wedged between the two trees. I've absolutely no ex explanation of how it got there. It was like it had dropped from the sky. There's someone sitting in the chair of some kind next to it, but they are very hard to see because of the shadows from the tree line. My buddy yells hello and waves and nobody moves. We continue to float a bit further away down the coast. So this is creepy. And I'm starting to feel anxious, so I go back to trying to reattach the gas line. Ended up basically doing a handstand in the engine compartment while my friend held my legs, but I got it back on. After a few tries, the boat starts back up and everything's good. At this point, we are all pretty fixated on this kid and the person with this mystery trailer that's sitting in the forest. So we drive back over to see what's going on. Nobody has moved. The kid's still staring, and the other person is sitting in the chair. We pull up maybe 25 feet from shore. The kid had something like a dowel or a broomstick or something next to him on the shore that maybe had a fishing line on it, so I tried to yell hello, and that we had engine issues and asked them if they're okay. This kid is watching us with his wrist curled back in this really weird, uncomfortable looking way and starts to tilt his head back and forth like a dog listening to the sound. Then things get crazy really fast. This person in the chair starts to whistle like a totally tuneless whistle, same pitch, but just these long, drawn out whistles. The little trailer door opens and a third person looks out at us, long hair, maybe a wo woman. Suddenly there's a bunch of cracking and a fourth person comes out of the trees, not running, but at a fast stride. Boat's still running, kids are tilting their head at us. The person in the chair's whistling. This man walks full stride to the water and starts swimming towards our boat. Just as he hits the water, three more people come out of the trailer. Everyone had long hair and it was super hard to see gender. They all made a dash for the water and start to swim towards us. I put the boat in drive and we started to pull away. There's just these four people swimming towards us. The kid hasn't moved and the person in the chair is still whistling. Driving the full trip back, nobody knew what to think. And our best guess was that these were some kind of vagrant people who lived there and were trying to scare us away. Still thing I get the most stuck on is what would have happened if they started swimming when the engine was dead. That and how they got this trailer in the middle of nowhere and jammed it between two trees. All right, folks, I hope you all enjoyed this night ending bonus upload as much as I enjoyed sharing it with you. I'd like to thank you all for supporting the channel. It is, after all, your support that keeps this channel growing and going. And honestly, what gives people a chance to share their experiences and theories judgment-free, simply treated with the respect that we all deserve. Thank you. Everyone stay safe, happy, healthy, and ever vigilant, keeping an eye on our children, pets, family, friends. These creatures are real out there, and they are dangerous. Share this information with those you love and care about, and it may just help save their lives someday. Until next time, never stop asking questions, never stop searching for answers, and God bless.